All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Madison Elliott. I'm the addictions interventionist here at TCPS. And today I have with me Beth Williams. She's the prevention consultant at the health department. She's going to be presenting on teen substance use prevention. Um, so any you know, questions, uh, comments, I just ask for you guys to you know, write them in the chat or the Q&A at the bottom. And we, we are happy to answer any um, comments, any questions at the end of the presentation. And I'm also going to be uh, having my email in the chat box for anyone who wants to email me um, for any you know, substance use related concerns, questions, support um, for any time. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and pass this along to Beth. I'm gonna make you a host. There we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Beth Williams, and I'm really glad to be back with you again uh, on this beautiful afternoon. We're going to talk today about uh, parenting uh, prevention for parents. And this is always a really wonderful topic for me. I love this topic because I feel like parents are, are the first teachers that we have, and they are the first uh, prevention uh, kind of sharing people that we have. So I'm really glad to be able to do this. And I hope that some of you were at our last couple of sessions as well. So let me go forward. Okay, what we'll cover today, uh, we're going to talk just uh, briefly about the scope of the problem. I've got uh, some survey data that is the latest that we have, uh, signs of alcohol and other drug use, what can parents do, primary prevention, prevention research, uh, if you suspect alcohol or other drug use as a parent, what you can do, some suggestions, uh, confronting your suspicions, presenting consequences, and then some general tips and resources at the end. So the scope of the problem, um, you know, we have many concerns going on right now, particularly with the pandemic, but um, there are a lot of mental health concerns among adolescents. Uh, those rates are rising. The uh, rates of anxiety in high school students is rising right now. Uh, underage drinking rates and rates of other drug usage. So again, I'm not going to get too deep into data, but I just want to kind of give you a feel for kind of where we are right now with this issue. So mental health concerns. Um, this one always concerns me a little bit. This is from the YRBS data, which is the uh, youth behavioral health, youth risk behavioral survey that comes out uh, every couple of years. And this is the latest we have a 2018, 2019 school year. So uh, what I've done here is I wanted to show you that I'm, uh, I'm reporting on the high school seniors from that year, but anything in purple are the students that that survey year were sophomores. So now they would be seniors. I thought it might be interesting to give it a little uh, present day reference as well. So 27% of high school seniors in that year reported feeling sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks in a row, so much so that they stopped doing some usual activities uh, in the last 12 months. And 29.4% uh, of the 10th graders who now most likely are seniors um, experience the same feelings. 17.8% uh, of seniors seriously considered attempting suicide, uh, and 11% made a plan. Uh, these are alarming numbers. 17.2% uh, of the 10th graders in that year seriously considered attempting, and 16% had a plan. Anxiety in adolescents, um, we hear this anecdotally almost every day that teachers, counselors, uh, parents are seeing increased anxiety in their adolescents. Um, this is coming from uh, what we, again, hear anecdotally is high expectations. Uh, uh, the youth are putting very high expectations on themselves in terms of, uh, you know, their grades and their performance. Feeling unsafe with all the lockdowns and drills in the last few years. And of course, a pandemic and uncertainty. Um, all this comes from healthychildren.org website. Uh, and nearly one in three of all adolescents uh, ages 13 to 18 will experience an anxiety disorder. Uh, and a survey that was also recently done was 41% of incoming college freshmen are reporting anxiety. Okay, underage drinking, here's some of the numbers. Um, over 10% of seniors and 18% of those who would be seniors now, according to this survey, had their first drink of alcohol before age 13. And that is not 
sips of alcohol from mom or dad. This is drinking alcohol. 36% uh, of the seniors, 34% of the sophomores currently drank alcohol and 25% of the seniors and 18% of the 10th graders were binge drinking at least one day in the last 30 days. Now binge drinking is four drinks for females, five drinks per males per setting within a two hour period. Okay. Again, I'm uh, go through these fairly quickly, but you will be able to access this on, uh, on this later on if you want to have this for reference. 4% uh, of seniors, 7% of the 10th graders had tried marijuana. Um, a pretty substantial amount had ever used marijuana of the seniors. And then 5.7%, I'm sorry, and 8% of the 10th graders had ever used synthetic marijuana, which is commonly known as spice. Um, and 23% currently reported using marijuana. Ever used, again, we're, we'll just look at this briefly. I won't read all the numbers to you, but you can see, you know, basically the, um, the substances that we worry about in this county are alcohol, uh, tobacco, which is, we do consider a gateway drug, and marijuana. Um, and then under the opioids, that just means that they used it uh, not prescribed for them or used it uh, without uh, inappropriately. It was not something that they should have been using. Okay, tobacco use. Okay, so current use of any form, you can see the numbers are huge, almost half. And this is a survey that's a couple years old. So uh, you can pretty much assume, I think, that um, the numbers are only going up. Vaping in uh, 20 out of the last 30 days, 20% of seniors and cigarettes, 2% uh, of seniors. So you can see that most of the tobacco use is coming from vaping. Okay, so signs of alcohol and other drug abuse. Um, always good for parents to get as much knowledge as possible, know what you're dealing with, kind of know the enemy, um, be prepared so that when questions or comments or concerns come up about your child, you um, have a little bit of knowledge under your belt. <clears throat> Now, when we show these signs and symptoms, again, it's going to be a pretty long and exhaustive list, but um, I think it's important always to remember that it can be easy to dismiss the changes as normal adolescent behavior. We know adolescents can be all over the map with mood, and with behaviors and with changing friends and those kind of things. So we don't want to cause any alarm if somebody notices one or two of these signs over time. But what we'd like parents to look for is extremes and patterns of behavior, patterns of change over time. Um, and, and is this unusual or not so-called normal for your child? So if social uh, gatherings are all of a sudden becoming more important to your child and your child has always been very shy and introverted, it might be something to keep an eye on. So some of the signs, you know, they kind of come in categories. We have physical signs and symptoms, changes in mood, personality, outlook, and appearance, uh, alcohol and drug friendly speech or attitude, problems with family, social behavioral issues, new interests, and school or work problems. So these are kind of the categories that uh, there will be some signs in. So we'll start with the physical signs, uh, you know, bloodshot, puffy eyes, frequent use of eye drops, frequent use of mouthwash, mints, gum, uh, sleeping in excessive amounts or very unusual times, slurred speech, staggering or stumbling, loss of coordination, tremors or shakiness, and physical injuries or ailments. So, you know, when people are often under the influence or starting to use, uh, they may have, you know, they may trip a lot more, they may get injuries, they may get burns, uh, from smoking marijuana, they might get stomach aches or headaches from using alcohol or other substances. And again, one incident of one of these things is not going to indicate that there is a drug abuse issue with your child, but we want you to look for anything unusual in these areas. So changes in mood, personality, uh, outlook and appearance, moodiness, defensiveness, secretiveness, avoidiveness, evasiveness, um, kind of, you know, feeling like things are maybe a little sneaky, maybe they're, um, you know, not as open with their parents or their family members as they used to be. Uh, alcohol, drug friendly speech and attitude. And this is really what we see a lot of. Um, everyone does it, you know, 
oh, if you're the parent, you're talking to your child, you know, everyone drinks, everyone smokes pot, everyone vapes. Um, and really the numbers as staggering as they are, uh, do show that many youth do not use. And sometimes we do that as kind of a flipping the data over a little bit, looking at the positive. And that can be very powerful for parents to use when their kids feel like everyone is doing it except them. Um, you can say, well, you know, we have a certain percentage drinking alcohol, but there are many more that are not. Uh, sometimes kids feel alone in that. Um, the problem isn't that bad in Talbot County. Uh, the drinking age should be lowered. Um, you know, I can vote and I can go in the military when I'm 18. I should be able to drink or use. Um, these are some of those attitudes that you may see. Uh, marijuana should be legalized. Marijuana is a natural plant. It's an organic thing. It's a healing thing. Okay. Problems with family, um, broken promises, threats of violence, increased conflicts, and sometimes even over minor issues. So, you know, someone who might have been a fairly calm and easygoing young person may often develop a temper over the most minor things. Consistent lying or the stories that don't add up. You know, the child went to the Friday night football game, but they can't say who won or went to a movie, but can't say what it was about. Um, or can't give you the name of the movie. One of the things I used to do with my kids um, was to drop them off at the movie theater and go around the corner and then come back around and make sure they weren't hanging around in the parking lot. Um, wasn't that I didn't trust them, but you know, sometimes you have to kind of ease your own mind with things. Um, broken rules and curfews and running away from home. Okay, social behavioral problems, again, withdrawal, lots of good friends, lo loss of good friends or a sudden change in the social circle, friends who are users or who are in legal trouble, uh, increased conflicts with friends, teachers, peers, teammates, uh, failing to get along in social situations or loss of interest in hobbies, sports or normal activities. And that loss of interest is, is usually a pretty early sign if it's something that all of a sudden the child who loved playing tennis, absolutely doesn't have any interest in tennis anymore and, and you can't figure that, that out. That would be something that might start to raise a red flag and, and a parent may want to uh, kind of keep, you know, keep track of things and keep an eye on, that, on the child. Um, <clears throat> new interests, so uh, alcohol or drug themed clothing, posters or stickers. Um, my coworker Logan and I about two years ago went to a conference, a national prevention conference in Chicago, and they had a speaker there who is a former police officer and his job now is to uh, do speaking engagements to let parents know specifically what to look for and uh, we are working on some way to bring some of that presentation um, to our county, but it, for instance, there are clothing brands or backpacks um, that look perfectly normal to us as parents, but may have um, symbols or wording on, the, on a t-shirt that alludes to drug use. It could be sneakers that uh, have special compartments where drugs can be kept or hidden. It could be backpacks with secret pockets inside that are very well hidden. Um, it's, it's incredible. And he showed us pictures just walking through Chicago one day and taking pictures of uh, store windows and pointing out things that most normal people would never have noticed. Um, so again, you know, those types of things, themed clothing, uh, unusual items in their car or their bedroom, um, smoking devices, maybe spoons, maybe uh, pill packages, uh, you know, little tins or canisters they can keep the drugs in, things like that. Um, one of the things I learned in a parenting class a long time ago was that uh, it is okay to occasionally check things out that don't feel right to you. So, um, you know, if your child is not home and you want to just go in and look in their bedroom, it's kind of a good scan to give you a taste of maybe where they are right now. You know, did they used to be into sports and now on their walls, they have posters of unusual things or things you don't recognize. Um, you know, are there things in the bedroom that seem like they shouldn't be in the bedroom? Uh, so it's okay to look and scan and put your mind at ease or, um, you know, maybe satisfy your curiosity and, and give you a reason to maybe investigate a little further. Uh, changes in like musical taste, uh, movies, even video games, things like that. You know, has there been a, a real change in those kind of things that the child, you know, kid, young adult 
uh, may have enjoyed at one time and now are, there's been a shift. An interest in previously ignored or disliked activity. So, you know, oh, I hate going to the mall, mom. And all of a sudden now they want to go to the mall every weekend, you know, things like that. Um, school and our work problems. This is normally where uh, parents learn for the first time uh, where there might be a problem with um, their adolescent in school. Um, typically it's going to be a declining in the grades, uh, inconsistent work habits, uh, change in classroom behavior, discipline referrals, maybe they're sleeping in class, maybe they're very wound up in class. Uh, incomplete or missing homework. That's a big one that we see a lot. The teacher will say, my gosh, their work used to be on time and now it's very inconsistent. I might not get an assignment. Uh, they might not even have bothered doing the work in class. Uh, teachers can be a real uh, good resource for us in, in terms of looking at our kids' behavior, not just their grades, but how it all ties together. Um, foregoing extracurricular activities, practices or games. Again, if a child has been so interested in soccer or tennis, or swimming, and all of a sudden, you know, they're not showing up to practices, they're not showing up to games, they're late to practice, um, they were kicked off of the team, and then they're blaming the coach, oh, the coach, you know, kicked me off the team, I don't know why, kind of a thing. So, um, again, school, um, school performance is a huge indicator of how a child's overall health and, and well-being is going many times. <clears throat> so if they're working outside of school, maybe they're taking a lot of work or sick days or no-shows, uh, they're tardy, uh, maybe they're getting stressed out and not able to really solve even basic uh, problems or issues at work, uh, getting easily frustrated at work, um, maybe decreased work or job performance, blaming problems on, on everyone else, you know, my teacher hates me, she didn't give me a second chance, my boss, you know, scheduled me a day I didn't want to work, you know, kind of blaming those things on other people and blaming and um, kind of projecting issues and problems really are a sign overall of what we see when someone is starting to get pretty deep on in an addiction process is just kind of that projecting the problems and blame on everybody else. Um, suspension, of course, expulsion or dropping out of school or being fired from a job are always huge warning signs, obviously, and, and uh, hopefully, you know, by an earlier intervention, it may not get to that point. If a child is just uh, uh, experimenting with marijuana or alcohol, uh, maybe that can be addressed right away and it won't get progressed to the point where it becomes very serious for their work in school. Okay, what can parents do? <clears throat> it's virtually guaranteed, and we talked about this at our last session, that adolescents will be exposed to alcohol and other drugs by the time they graduate. Um, it's not guaranteed that they will use. There are some things that many, many things actually that parents can do to postpone that first use of alcohol or tobacco. Um, you know, the longer that we postpone those drugs that are right now legal for adults, um, you know, the, the healthier that person will grow up um, and become a more healthier adult. <clears throat> so a teen initiating alcohol use is four times more likely to develop alcohol dependence as an adult so that later we can postpone that alcohol use the better. And uh, early tobacco use can be a gateway to other substance use. We don't hear that term gateway drug much anymore, but um, it truly is a process that happens. Most young people that end up using what we might call heavy drugs, uh, opioids and other things, do not start using those drugs. Um, they may start smoking with friends at an early age or um, you know, having a drink at, at a friend's house when the parents aren't home. And it kind of progresses into heavier, the heavier dependence on other things. Okay, so one of the main things that parents can do based on the research that's out there and, and uh, just uh, best practices in the prevention field is communicate a clear age appropriate non-use message. Um, again, alcohol is not legal for anyone under the age of 21. Um, other substance use are, it's non-negotiable. You know, the parent, you know, you are not to drink alcohol until you're 21. You are not to use other substances. Um, verbalizing the consequences, you know, loss of privileges uh, and enforcing them. And um, this can be done in a number of ways, initiating discussions very, uh, when they're young, uh, and letting them know what the consequences will be if they are caught with alcohol or other drugs. 
Um, you can do a contract with them and we'll talk a little more about that, I think in the next slide. And also um, decrease access. So in your home, if you have medications, if you have opioid drugs or pain medications or uh, even alcohol, you know, put those things away where they can't be reached by a young person. Um, you know, if you have a liquor cabinet, lock that up. If you have uh, other substances, uh, you can use uh, some kind of a safer storage method, and I'll show you some of those in a second. Okay, so this is a written agreement um, that Logan, my coworker, found uh, coming out of, I believe, the CDC. And um, this, it doesn't have to be verbatim, but this is kind of a good reference point or a good outline. If somebody, you know, if you want to start the discussions with your young person um, about um, what is expected and, and what will be enforced in terms of, of alcohol and other drug use. So you can see the caregiver can pledge to do their part in um, trying to be open, trying to be present, trying to talk to them about the dangers and effects creating a safe environment at home, um, pledging to pick them up. This is an important piece, um, to pick them up at any time or place if, if they find themselves in an uncomfortable situation where drinking or other drug use is involved. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and the son, you know, the son or daughter, um, they understand that um, these substances can be harmful. They pledge to avoid situations where friends and peers are drinking and promise to call or text to um, the parent to help remove them from these situations. So again, it doesn't have to be verbatim. You may want to put specific something specific to your family. You may want to put consequences in there. You know, I understand if I am caught um, drinking, I will have my phone taken away or I'll have my car taken away, which is a huge one when they start to drive. That does give some leverage with um, with drinking and driving, et cetera. But you know, it's always good to kind of have these discussions way ahead of time. It's a preventative thing. It's a proactive thing that you can do um, to just kind of make it clear what your, uh, you know, what your feelings are about this. <clears throat> Safe storage and disposal of medications. This is just kind of a little plug for the health department because we uh, give out these materials. So you'll see there's a left-hand side there. There's a medication safe. And we really encourage people, even if you don't have, um, what would typically be considered uh, drugs that uh, people may abuse, maybe heart medication or blood pressure or you know, uh, depression or other kind of medications. But we really encourage people to put their medications in a safe place that is not accessible. Um, young kids can often get into medicine cabinets. Sometimes medications are left out and people's pets get into the medication. So we're really trying to promote safe storage and usage of medication. So that is a medication safe. And next to that, that white bottle is what we call a pill pod. And these come in handy actually for people that um, may be senior citizens. We give a lot of these out because they're easy to use. You can see the numbers are very big. It's very easy to maneuver. Um, and then up on the right hand corner is a, what are deterra bags and um, we give those out if people have a medication or a prescription that they need to get rid of they can just pour it into that bag. Uh, it can be thrown away in the trash it's very easy to use. Um, and we also have drop boxes in the county uh, the sheriff's office and uh, state police barracks uh, Oxford PD and down in St. Michael's so. Um, there are ways to dispose of medications that are no longer needed so that young people who shouldn't be able to access them are not accessing them and keeping them safe. <clears throat> okay, primary prevention. This is where it gets kind of fun. It's not such a downer. It's um, going back, taking a few steps back and looking at what preemptive things can be done. And we have to look at this almost like it is um, a threat, which it is. It's a threat. It's an enemy. It's a it's a um, challenge to the health of our child. Um, we wanna keep um, our conversations with our kids very age appropriate. And there are ways to do that. We certainly probably don't wanna talk about drinking and driving to a seven or eight year old in a, in a huge context. Whereas a 16 or 15 year old, that's a huge conversation to be having. Um, if you have college age, uh, children, you know, you don't want to probably be talking about the first time you've ever tasted alcohol. You have to be careful. You may want to talk about harm reduction and being safer and safer drinking and not drinking and driving. So try to keep it age appropriate. And, and we have some slides on that. 
uh, we want to lower the risk. So uh, the risk of being exposed, the risk of them picking up that drug or that alcohol for the first time. Uh, and we want to trust and verify, um, not necessarily trust but verify, but do both. You know, we can trust our children, tell them we trust them, but once in a while we may need to verify. And, and if something in that voice in the back of our head is, is feeling not right, there's nothing wrong with driving by the movie theater or you know, driving by Taco Bell, if they say they're going to Taco Bell with their friends after the movie, you know, there's nothing wrong with kind of verifying without, um, you know, hovering over them every minute. But if you have that feeling in the back of your head, there's nothing wrong with it, trying to verify that. Okay, this is more primary prevention. This is kind of the fun stuff. Um, listen, listen, listen. Um, you know, a lot of times our youth are saying things that we may not really hear the way we should be hearing them or the way they want to be heard. So listen, um, ask for clarification, um, do what we call active listening, which is, you know, making eye contact, uh, you know, using your expressions or using your body language, um, verifying and asking questions, uh, asking them for clarification, um, you know, all that active listening so that that, um, that adolescent, that child knows that we are present in the moment with them and we're hearing what they're saying. Um, use teachable moments. And this is always fun with smaller kids because dare is just such a huge part of their life when they're in elementary school. I know it has not been uh, lately, but once things get back to normal, um, these kids will come home and talk about, you know, Officer Tim told me this. And, uh, you know, I learned this about smoking and, and you know, they'll start to question our own habits. Mom, are you smoking? You shouldn't be smoking. Officer Tim says, don't smoke. But it really does give us some wonderful teachable moments with our kids. You know, wow, what did you learn in D.A.R.E. today? How did that make you feel? Did you know that before? You know, are you, were you surprised to hear some of these things? Um, the same with TV. If they're watching TV or they're watching a, a show and a commercial comes on, uh, sometimes that presents really good um, moments that we can piggyback on and open up some conversation um, or even issues with friends, you know, oh, I heard that your friend got in a fight in the playground. What, what was that about? Wow, that must have been scary. What's going on with that? How do you feel? Um, when you get to adolescence, we can use teachable moments that maybe are a little bit um, more, have a little more weight to them. Um, you know, news of DWIs, accidents. It just seems like every year there are always, you know, some accidents that happen around prom and graduation and um, you know, what is that like for, to go through that, to know somebody that maybe was involved in an accident, um, maybe somebody that was suspended or arrested for uh, substance abuse, or maybe, you know, there was a search at the school. I'm not sure if they still bring the, the dogs in, but when my kids were in high school, they would bring the dogs in to search um, the lockers and also out in the parking lot. And, you know, that kids will come home with a lot of feelings about that. And that's a good way to open that door a little bit as well and talk talk about that. Um, validating their concerns and their feelings. Um, you know, if say it is a drug search and your child comes home and they're very angry, I don't, I don't like, you know, them coming in and searching my locker. You know, you could say, well, boy, how did that feel? Well, my privacy was invaded. Okay, well, what, why do you think that was important for them to do? And you can kind of, you know, get at it that way a little bit. There's no perfect way to do this, but um, I think just the listening and the validating and hearing what they're saying is really crucial. And then ask, 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 you know, open-ended questions. Um, try to ask something that the answer isn't going to be yes or no or rolling the eyes, but you know, it might be, um, you know, how did you feel? What was that like? Um, I thought I heard something. Did you hear about that? Um, you know, being inquisitive does not mean being accusatory. Sometimes our kids might uh, feel that way, but um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being questioning about what's going on with their life. Okay, so prevention research um, shows, this is a fun one too, eating meals together as often as possible, at least once a day, can decrease teen substance abuse by up to 50%. Um, and you know, this has been repeated and has constantly, consistently shown up in the research for years and years. Um, I think that oftentimes we don't, uh, we think as our kids are getting older, maybe they're not as into family time or into spending time together, but having that one meal a day uh, 
can really make a huge difference. Now, I know a lot of people are feeling, oh my gosh, my kids are in sports and they're in you know, activities after school and they might not get home till eight at night, but figure it out. You know, Maybe it's breakfast where you're sitting and having a cup of coffee together before they run out the door, or maybe it's um, a snack after school, or maybe when you're at their um, you know, baseball practice, you can take a five minute break and, and bring them a sandwich, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the whole thing is about being together and the meals, mealtime really seems to be one of those things that consistently seems very important to young people. Um, they also report that they look to their parents first for guidance on decision-making and problem solving around alcohol and other drug use. Um, they are watching us, what, what our behavior is, what our acceptance level is of these things. So um, it's very important uh, as they are going into adolescence, especially to try to be less friend and more parent because they have a lot of friends, but they need someone to really have their best interests at heart. And so that is what, how really we as parents can, um, you know, really impact upon how they make decisions about these difficult issues. Okay. So more primary prevention. Again, these are all things we can do kind of preemptively to um, you know, build a little resilience and protection around them in terms of um, their risk of using. Encourage them to get involved in activities or hobbies. Uh, that's an old one. We all kind of know that uh, idle hands, that whole thing about idle hands, you know, it's always good to have something for them to do after school or uh, on weekends. <clears throat> Encourage them to develop healthy friendships communicate often and uh, help them develop resistance skills, some kind of an out or a code word. And I think we referred to this a little bit earlier. If, um, you know, if you talk through and have a plan so that if your um, son or daughter is at a, an event and people are using or drinking and they're uncomfortable, you know, give them a way out of that. You know, oh my gosh, my parents would just kill me. You know, my mother would take my phone away. Um, you know, I'd have to uh, quit cheerleading because they won't, you know, they're not gonna be able to drive me there and they're taking my car away. So give them some kind of an out with, with a situation like that, a safe way to be out of it with while they can kind of save face with their friends. Um, or a code word. We've had um, several parents talk about, you know, if the student is on the phone and says, you know, mom, I got a flat tire. Can you come pick me up? Maybe flat tire is your code word for I really am feeling a little uncomfortable or unsafe and I need you to come pick me up. And that kind of goes back to that contract too, where, um, you know, that they know that their parent has their back. Okay, so normalize one-on-one -on -one time. And this is always kind of a chuckle because I think most of us, our lives get so busy if we said to our, you know, son or daughter, you know, hey, let's, uh, let's go for a ride and get a coffee. They might look at you like, what are you talking about? What, what's the matter? What did I do now? Um, but, you know, sometimes um, if the meal times or the, you know, things are so hectic and busy that it, you can't always pull off having a meal every day together, um, you know, some brief check-ins, you know, hey, let's go get ice cream or coffee. Um, in my family, my parents would always, my mother would always say, why don't you sit and have a cup of tea? And that always kind of was our code word for, let's just kind of chat and catch up a little bit. Um, let's go take a walk, you know. Um, can you give me a hand with, uh, you know, taking this trash out to the curb? You take one can, I'll take the other. It gives you a chance to just kind of have a brief moment of, of uh, communication and, you know, being together. Um, and then be appreciative. You know, it's a lot of times we hear kids say, well, my parents don't care. They don't, you know, appreciate what I do. Well, you know, we do. Of course we do. But sometimes we just don't always think to go that extra step. And I think just a little thank you for helping me today can really go a long way. Um, my very favorite is the car time because in those, you know, moments we have between dropping them off at the line at school or um, taking them to practice or picking them up from practice. That is a time where um, we're with them briefly, but they're kind of a captive audience. So, you know, it's a, kind, it's a time to kind of maybe have some open-ended questions. What was, the, you know, what was the, way, the worst thing that happened to you today? What was the best thing that happened? You know, how is so-and-so doing with their project? You know, anything like that, that gives you a, a few moments of time that can really be maximized. Okay, and we tend to do this more when our kids are younger and then they get older and we sometimes feel adolescents are pushing their parents aside, but I, I 
guarantee that it's important uh, to do these things. My son and I used to go to Rita's every day when it was the first day of spring. You know, it sounds silly, it sounds dumb, but I'd pick him up from school and we'd go to Rita's and get a get an Italian ice. And for those 10 minutes, you know, we were together and, and it was nice. So anything that you feel would be appropriate and fun. Okay. So all that wonderful prevention stuff. Um, hopefully if, um, you know, hopefully that works and we don't get into situations, but things happen, kids are confronted with things, cir circumstances change, um, you know, situations come up that maybe we didn't anticipate. And that's part of the whole ride with being a parent. Um, so if you suspect something, again, I really can't emphasize, trust your gut and your suspicions and try to um, validate or verify what's going on. Gather the facts. Um, you know, what would your normal, would the normal version of your kid be doing this? So, you know, it might be the sleeping. Are they sleeping so much and they used to be the first person up in the morning and now they're having, you know, trouble getting out of bed? You know, and then besides that, maybe they're not eating and they're getting headaches all the time and they're late to their class. You know, you can start to piece these things together. Um, before confronting, I would um, try to team up with a spouse if that's possible, presenting a united front, um, practice a conversation beforehand, uh, decide on the consequences beforehand, and, and um, do not confront the person if you're. Um, son or daughter comes home and they, you can tell that they're under the influence of something that would probably not be the best time to confront this fully other than to acknowledge I, uh, it looks like you've been drinking. We're gonna have to talk about this. Okay, so confronting. Um, always start with a caring attitude, a caring um, approach. Um, is there something going on that I or we need to know about? Um, you know, the I or the we messages are always the best thing. Again, it's kind of like those open-ended questions, but these are open-ended kind of, you know, coming from us and they're not being, um, you know, you did this or you look like this or whatever, you know. I observed that um, you smelled like alcohol when you got home. You know, I noticed that your clothes were wrinkled. It looks like you, um, you know, wore the same clothes two days in a row, you know. It seems like your attitude is getting a little more um, angry, you know, all those kind of things. So it's kind of, you're confronting, but you're not kind of beating them over the head with it. You know, you're, you're doing this in a way that is concerning and caring, which of course it is. Um, try to be calm, easier said than done, but uh, try to be, you know, presenting facts or observations uh, and try to avoid the blaming or the accusing. Um, now, that being said, make sure that you're prepared for some emotional reaction from your child. It could be they're accusing you, they most likely will deny and blame and minimize. Um, but try to, again, hold your ground, present the facts, reinforce how often, reinforce often how much you care and your concerns about the whole situation. And if this is a first time, you can say, you know, I know things are tempting and it seems to me like you're at this party and, and you kind of felt pressure to drink and you know, I can understand how that must have been uncomfortable for you. However, you know, our rule in this house is that you don't drink till you're 21. Um, so reinforce those things. And again, that's the next slide here. Refer back to what your household rules are. And even if you don't have official rules, you know, kind of what your uh, policy or your practice has always been, what you've always told them. You know, remember we talked about no drug use or we talked about um, not smoking. Um, you know, we talked about not being in situations where um, you're around people that are drinking. So um, present the consequences firmly and directly. And again, if you've talked about this before and you've talked about not only your rules or your, your uh, feelings about things, but what the consequences would be, then you're kind of covered because that's your insurance. You know, you could say, well, remember we talked about that and we said if you were ever caught drinking, you would not um, have your phone for a week. So we're going to take your phone away you know, and just firmly and directly. Um, expect efforts to manipulate or try to get you to change your mind. Um, and if the conversation escalates, again, this doesn't have to be a long drawn out thing. Um, it's probably best to end it and before things can really get heated up. Okay, so hard to do this because I want to say, are there any questions, you know? 
<laughs> but um, okay, so general tips. This was a lot of information today, but I think there are some um, pretty pretty consistent, um, simple things that um, make some common sense in this whole thing. Um, spending time together and normalizing it. Um, again, if it's five minutes, you know, when you're in the car driving them to work, it's always a good time to connect. Um, initiate communication early, make sure it's uh, age appropriate. Um, don't make it a big deal if all of a sudden, you know, uh oh, mom wants to talk to me, what did I do? If it feels normal that every day you check in, um, then it won't be a big deal and you'll be on top of things. Um, praise and encourage positive choices, accentuating the positive. Um, this is so important. And again, we talked earlier about that data. You know, if they say, you know, I, I uh, my friend started smoking and I just really don't want to smoke, you, you can have that conversation. Well, you know, a lot of kids don't choose to smoke um, or vape, but, um, you know, it sounds like you, that's a choice you would make. And that's really great that you're doing that. And there are so many other people around that share that positive choice with you. Um, and express concern often about safety and well being. Again, going back to where they really honestly do look toward parents for guidance and um, security and support. Okay. This is just a slide we used last time, but we hear this all the time. Um, you know, there are parents out there that uh, genuinely do feel that their kids and their friends are safer drinking at home or using, it's in some cases, because they're not out drinking and driving. Um, you know, I guess it probably sounds good on the surface that at least there's some place where you know where they are. But, um, you know, it's, it's not good practice for parents for several reasons. Um, first thing is it's illegal to give alcohol to friends and it sets a dangerous precedent, precedent that you can condone an illegal activity. Um, so that can be, you know, again, we can be seen as kind of not as credible if we're trying to keep our kids from using, but we're allowing it to happen kind of. So, um, okay, parents can be held liable or fined. Uh, there can be other legal consequences for anything happens or any damage. And a DWI is only one of many results or consequences of drinking or excessive drinking. Alcohol poisoning is one, um, violence, et cetera. Okay. More tips, um, express your disapproval of substance abuse. Again, this goes back to when you're talking, it can start in the days when they're in DARE, they're learning about uh, some of those things in school. Um, you know, express your disapproval right up front and be firm about it. Be clear with your expectations. Um, there's a picture there, be expectations of them and their use, um, initiate conversations, expressing your expectations and alternatives and consequences. So that goes back to that contract again. Um, help them develop ways to resist and be comfortable saying no. Um, have a plan, help them develop that plan. Do you have a code word if they need to make a phone call? Um, do they have a ready excuse for, you know, I really want to, you know, party, but my parents would take away my phone or my parents would be so mad at me or whatever. Um, okay, so resources. Um, there is a project through the prevention office uh, and we have a wonderful website with a lot of resources for parents. It talks about, uh, again, a, a good refresher on what to look for, what to do, um, how to have those conversations. I think it even addresses, um, you know, if your child were to ask you, well, what did you do in high school? Did you drink? Did you smoke pot? You know, you smoke cigarettes. You know, why are you telling me? I can't do it. So it really goes into more depth about having those kind of conversations with our kids. Um, and that website is there. It's um, www.iwishiknewmidshore.org. <clears throat> SAMHSA.gov is a very good resource and they also have a phone number as well. That's a federal agency. They do a lot of the funding of our programs. <clears throat> um, they have wonderful resources that are, everything is free for parents, uh, ways to communicate with kids, et cetera. Uh, Midshore Behavioral Health is a wonderful resource in our community. They have a huge resource guide that can help parents um, if, you know, it is to the point where you feel your child may need some help, um, either, you know, um, some um, emotional issues or substance abuse issues. Okay. The Prevention Office is located right in Easton on Hanson Street in the Health Department. 
um, we have lots of information on alcohol and other drugs and parent prevention tips. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have the medication lock boxes and medication disposal bags um, and just lots of other things. So if, uh, for instance, we're making, um, we're donating some items to the aftergrad um, celebrations that will be going on this year. So we always have a lot of some goodies in there um, that have messaging on it that uh, promotes healthy lifestyles and prevention. So we really encourage you to call. Um, we're always happy to go out in the community or um, be virtually in the community and uh, answer questions or get the information out. So we really thank you for the opportunity and we thank uh, Madison for allowing us to use this platform to reach parents. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Oh, you can type it in the chat box. We'll see if we can answer those questions. I know that was a lot of information at once, and I know that um, Madison has uh, recorded this so that folks can hopefully access it down the road and go through it at a slower pace. <laughs> 